Hello and welcome to The Nature Connection, Science, Wildlife and Environment Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy. Welcome, everyone. Birds the word today. Uh Nancy, it's your favorite song. Uh, (laughs) Jonathan Alderfer is joining us. He is an artist, author, and editor, and he has specialized in painting birds and natural history subjects for more than 30 years. He's National Geographic's resident birding expert for 10 years, and he's authored, edited, and illustrated over 20 books for the National Geographic Society, including the best-selling Field Guide to the Birds of North America, the seventh edition, Birding Essential, right. Backyard Guide to the Birds of North America, and Complete Birds of North America. And most recently, he's authored the second edition of National Geographic's Kids Bird Guide of North America. It's out now. I encourage you to go and get it. It is absolutely beautiful. And you know what? I think you can be any age to enjoy this book. It's, it's taught me a lot already. I like it. <laughs> I, I want to get crafty with some of these uh, crafts and things hmm. to do and start doing bird lists. Uh, but you can go to Jonathan's website. It's jonathanaldefer.com. And uh, that's Jonathan with a T-H-A-N. And welcome to the show, Jonathan. How are you? Thanks, Lisa. It's good to talk to you today. Hey, I know Nancy and I are really excited about this. We love birds. We go out in national parks and state parks and refuges and you know, backyards. <laughs> we sneak into people's backyards yeah. to look at birds in the morning. They just don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's a thing, you know. And I think this is so exciting that a book is dedicated uh, for kids to have their own bird book. I think there's something about, you know, it's like now that they've got a new hobby. Is, is that part of the reason to do yeah. this? Is get them to get outside. Yeah, um, you know, and put down that electronic device or something. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's good to have a, virtu- a real experience rather than a virtual one. So um, I hope that, that at least some parents or grandparents will go out of their way to pick up this book for their kids or grandkids and introduce them to the bir- world of birds because, um, like, I'm preaching to the choir, to you and, and Nancy, but... Um, you know, it's a it's a fascinating word, world and uh, that revolves around birds. And one thing people I like to point out to people is that birds are the most seen, common, and seen of of the wild animals that live around us that we share the planet with. Um, I, I would venture to guess that very few people could say I n- I didn't see a bird today. I mean, if you go outside, you're you're likely to see or at least hear birds, even if you're in a city. So mm-hmm. to to be able to connect to the, the natural world, birds are, are the perfect vehicle. Plus, they're beautiful. They fly. I mean, what's not to like, right? They're cool. Yeah, they're really cool. I like that you divided <clears throat> up um, the book into having sections for like, okay, here's your bayou and swamp birds, which, oh man, that's, I have a thing about that, man. Mm. Uh, but then you've got like your city <laughs> birds and then, you know, go, you know, the Western yeah. backyard birds, you know, so you've divided it up from where we actually get to understand a little bit more because um, I think that's important. They, like you said, that kids know that there's, you know, birds in the city and they do fly in wherever they want to. If there's water, they're coming. Right? Right. If there's food, they're coming. I, uh, I, I, one day this last May, I was in New York City uh, at, at the perfect migration time and um, did some birding in Central Park, which is really one of the premier birding locations in a city in North America because it's surrounded by so much, so many buildings and pavements that this, this large swath of green. Uh, attracts any bird that's flying within, you know, miles of the place. They, it's like a refuge. So it, it's incredible how, how many birds you, you can see in the city. Mm. See, I think that's important for, for kids to know. And, and, for, and also if people live in the city and don't have the uh, ability or the opportunity to go like, okay, we're going to go to Yosemite or something like that, right? Yeah, exactly. Or out here in, right. in our desert area, like Saguaro National Park to go birding, or out into nature, I think sometimes people think that they have to, you know, be like that to get out there and that they need lots of gear to do it. And you really don't need that much gear. You you can get binoculars and things like that, but you right. can just use your eyes and your ears. You can. I mean, it's, it's you know, 
binoculars are, uh, are are a great help, and and kids need to learn how to use them properly. So if an adult can help them initially, especially the the younger ones, sometimes have a little trouble holding them and the right, or focusing them. But if you're patient and you work with them, and you know the, the trick to focusing on birds, for instance, with binoculars is to look at the bird with without the binoculars and then don't look down at your binoculars just lift them up to your eyes and nine times out of ten the bird will be right in your view through the binoculars because if you're just you're, you're already focused on the bird and the and the what the binoculars mm-hmm. doing are only uh, magnifying it so but what you said earlier is also true you don't need binoculars particularly if you're in a place where you can put up a bird feeder um, mm. because then some of the bird not you know there are a lot of species that don't come to bird feeders but uh, a bird feeder a hummingbird feeder uh, you get a great experience of uh, some of the birds that are living right around your house um, and we have a I don't know if you noticed in the back there's there are, there's well, I think you said you didn't uh, there's some craft projects Mm. Um, and one of them is how to make, I really like this one, how to make a bird feeder out of a two liter plastic, um, soda uh, bottle, um, very little money to use a couple of wooden, uh, kitchen spoons to be serve as perches and, and places where the seed can spill out to, uh, very simple to make. And if you do it, you know, it probably needs some adult supervision if your child is young. But if you do it and, and involve the, the the kids with the project, they when a bird when a bird first comes to that feeder, it's like, wow, I did that. I helped make that. There's that birdie. It'll be like a really memorable experience. And uh, you know, if you don't have binoculars to start out, that's uh, that's a good way to go. It's amazing to me how. Um, birds get used to your presence like out on our patio we have um, these old burdens and we've watched yeah, them burden. for yeah. Yeah, two years now nesting in a tree down below us on one side of the of the house and then you you get to they come right up to the feeder that we give them a slice of orange and water mm-hmm. and they are here all day long and they don't care if we go in and out sit next to them they're about maybe four feet away from us and they don't care that we're here yeah that's great those are pretty little birds with their yellow heads and and i don't know yeah. if you see the young ones so the young if you see the young ones they they don't have any yellow they they develop that over their first year of, of life um yeah they're sort of just you know, brownish the parents actually bring um their babies right mm. up us while they're feeding and they feed them the orange and we can yeah. sit and watch that it's so cool it's so yeah, exciting that's cool. I, I think it, mm. it's also important you know water is one of the easiest things to do and you've got uh, you know right. ideas on how to make your own bird bath and i think that's a neat thing especially you know yeah. i don't know out here in the desert it's important you see these birds that are hot and it's panting absolutely. you start to get nervous right. about them but that's a natural <clears> thing for <throat> them to do right panting is part of their way of keeping cool yeah, it is. I mean, it's through evaporation of the, uh, out of their mouth helps them stay cool. So it is a normal behavior. But, you know, desert birds, uh, most desert birds need to have a water source of some of some type. And there, there are a few, I think, roadrunners, for instance, you know, they eat lizards and snakes and things like that. And they get enough moisture with their with their food. Uh, so they don't absolutely have to, to drink. But there are a lot of birds that need to drink every day. So particularly where you are in, in, the, in a desert community, um, you know, a bird bath is going to be a real magnet for, for mm-hmm. birds. And we have a really neat little project where you can make a bird, you know, it, it gives you some ideas of how to make a bird bath out of um, some, uh, some plant planters with a saucer stacked, uh, three sizes of stacked plant, uh, planters, and then a saucer on top, and uh, the elevator off the ground is is not absolutely necessary, but uh, you'll probably get more birds that way. You could just put a plant saucer on the ground and fill it with water and change it every day, and, and you, birds would like that too. Mm, very nice. I, mm. Now, I want to talk about some of the regional birds 
especially the swamps and the bayous, because I think <laughs> okay. they are, it, it has been some of our most amazing experiences. And I think kids, and I think number one, birding for families is like one of the coolest activities. It, it's a to-do thing, yeah, you know, um, when you're out uh -huh. traveling, and especially this summer. Um, but when you, if you get the opportunity to go kayaking or on a boat in the bayou or swamp area, if you get that opportunity, or you get to see the rookery, that is the coolest. Mm -hmm. It's it's one of the best things in the world to me <laughs> to go watch these baby egrets kind of bop around in Ahingas, and you have the Ahingas, and one of our favorite places, the Ahinga, yeah. Ahinga Trail in yes. the Everglades, is one of the best places. Yes, I've Ahinga. been on that. Right. Oh, isn't it cool? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 very cool. And there's another one, um, the Corkscrew Swamp in Florida too has a has a fantastic uh boardwalk through the swamp that uh Ooh. you can see all these birds too. Nice. Um but yeah, no, seeing them in a kayak is particularly wonderful because uh you know, birds get a little bit um they're more afraid of a person standing up and profile. For instance, you can get quite close to birds if you're in a car, <clears throat> believe it or not, car, big car, huge, you'd think it would scare birds off, but actually it's a, it works as a blind and you can oftentimes, particularly in a refuge or a national park, you can drive up to birds in a car and if you get out, the birds will fly off, but yeah. the car, so anything that sort of um, disguises your, the human profile that, that birds know is potentially dangerous anyway, um, is a good thing for getting getting close to birds. Hmm. Also wearing clothes that aren't, um, you know, I guess probably in the, except if you were in a winter snowstorm, white is about the worst color to wear if you go out birding because it's um, it stands out against the landscape so dramatically. Hmm. Even in the desert, uh, you know, less less so in the desert where it's sort of paler, everything's paler. But um, if you're in a forest or a dark area in particular, white is, is some of the birds see that. They're very attuned to uh, color and, and movement. So if they see this large white object moving, they're, they're, they tend to move away from that. Um, so that's uh, it's a little tip. <laughs> <laughs> but also, they also, whenever you start to um, pick up your camera, they're like, okay, bye. That's it. We know. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yes. But it's probably not, it's probably not the camera they're reacting. It's probably more your motion of trying to get the camera, pulling it up to your face. And uh, yeah, it's like, they don't, they don't really understand cameras, obviously. Although they might understand something about guns, I suppose. And yeah. they could have have a have a mistaking mistaking a camera for a gun in some ways but um that that brings me to the next yeah, part getting, you, getting okay. kids out in and in, into nature and learning that patience of watching a bird you know and then having that enjoyment of watching one but being that just sitting back and mm -hmm. watching creates right that can be that can be tough with kids yeah, mm -hmm. it can be tough. And you have to do it in small doses. I mean, you can't you can't take your you can't expect your kids uh or just even one one child um not to get antsy after, you know, 15 or 20 minutes. It's something you have to work up mm -hmm. to. And small doses are good too, you know, if you can just um sort of start the uh, the process of of walking quietly in nature rather than you know, running and stopping and running and stopping or making uh, uh, noise with your feet or whatever, talking loudly, that all, all that helps. I mean, you can still see birds, especially in places where they've become accustomed to seeing people. And, you know, like you were saying on this, on, on trails in national parks, um, birds are accustomed to that. So they're less uh, frightened by it. But if you're in general, uh, you know, uh, it's it's much better to be quiet than than make a lot of noise. Obviously, yeah, it's, it's about being that, that quiet part. And and this this other part, um, the conservation part. Do you think that you know, with with kids, they become like stewards of the land and stewards of birds and understand, you know, that we need to protect them, especially if they're doing bird baths and and, mm -hmm. and things like that, or traveling out with their family yeah. and watching. You know, like I think about. 
like Pinnacles National Park is, is a park that to me is really incredible in Central California, what they do um, mm -hmm. with, the, with California condors. And for kids to hike yeah. all the way up to where you can see them, I mean, you, it's a hike, everyone. That's a Unless hike. they fly over you, you're lucky. Um, it's a hike up there, but it's like that reward of like possibly seeing mm -hmm. these nesting California <laughs> condors. But then they're learning these conservation stories and, and you know, what people are really doing to protect these birds and bring them back, uh, you know, bring the population back. So I look at that going, we're, we're, we're breeding conservationists <laughs> if we get them out there, you know? <laughs> Yeah, well, I think you're right. And, you know, the first the first step, I think, um, to conservation is being uh, knowing what you're looking at. I mean, how can you if you're just seeing a bird, you or even a condor? Yeah, it's a pretty impressive bit, but it's a vulture. It's a large bird. But if you know some of you know, if you can identify the bird, that's that's kind of the first step towards conservation, because if, until you know a bird or an animal, uh, you're not going to care about it and you're not going to want to conserve it. But, and the first step to knowing it is to put a name to it. So I think it's really important. Um, it's not just a, a you know, a, an intellectual exercise to, to put a name to a bird. It's really part of the conservation uh, uh, ethic as well. Mm. You know, it's it's. I like that. That get him out there, get him to be junior rangers, everyone, junior birders, <laughs> right. and and doing a list. Um, what is where where do we start with this? Because I know there's different lists. You you've got the backyard bird list. There's life list. There's where, what is the yeah. list to get a child started on to start tracking their birds, their bird experiences. Well, uh, I think it would be pretty cool to. Um, keep a backyard list or even a, a bird feeder list. Um, you know, keep, put it on a, on a, you know, post something on the refrigerator or something like that and, and keep track of uh, new birds that you see in your yard. That, that might be a, a kind of an interactive way of, of doing it, you know, and um, if you have multiple kids, you can, you know, it's a little competition. And I saw a new bird today. Ha ha. You know, and it's like that gets them, keeps them interested and keeps them uh, excited about identifying the birds as well. Especially you know, if you have birds that migrate in and out over different seasons. Right. I mean, it's really exciting when a whole different kind of bird arrives. You know, and you can, and we yeah, and that's like out here in the desert, like you can, it's pretty obvious when there's a new bird in town. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's, yeah, there's not much place to hide, right? And yeah. and you hear them and, and see them and some of them are, you know, have spent the winter in Mexico. Others have gone, you know, as far south as South America. Um, and in the winter, you get different birds as well, birds that have been nesting farther north and come down and spend the winter months in the in the desert south southwest uh, mm -hmm. so there's a change uh, both in the in the spring and summer and in the and in the fall and winter too i wanted yeah. to point out before we um, yeah. moved on though that there is a section in the book uh, i don't know if you noticed it's called birds in peril Mm, um, yes. It's in the middle of the book, and we were talking about California condors, and there is a little entry there for condors, and and um, there's birds in peril in North America, and there are six species that are um, have little profiles. Uh, these are endangered endangered species, um, and that's kind of interesting. And then there's on the next page after that, there are birds in peril around the world because actually. North America has fewer birds that are endangered than most other parts of of the uh, of the world um, because a lot of birds in tropical areas or mountainous areas of South America have very small ranges, and so any change in their habitat might even wipe the entire species out um, mm -hmm. so uh, to give it a little international um flavor we we wanted to put in make sure people didn't misunderstand if they were new to the subject of birds that that endangered species um are all are all over the world not just you know they might know about the ones in north america but there are many more endangered species throughout the world 
Yeah, you, I was looking at the, is it kakapo? That I'm, yeah, the kakapo, right. Yeah. It's a flightless, it's a flightless parrot. It's really unusual and mm. it's, it can't fly. It's very heavy. It shuffles around on the, on the under, uh, growth and uh, looks for fallen fruit and things like that. And yeah, there's an interesting story there about how they, they were, um, they were really on the verge of extinction on the mainland of uh, New Zealand and the, the main island, I guess. And mm -hmm. they moved them. Uh, they they captured all of the of them and moved them off to a um, some offshore islands that didn't have any predators. Like you know, in in New Zealand, rats, uh, oddly, oddly enough, are a big problem because they prey on nestlings and bird eggs. So for ground nesting birds that evolved with no predators like that. Um, they had really no defense. So, uh, but they've they've done they've responded pretty well on these offshore islands. It's an interesting story. The other thing too, in in the American or the North American birds, I had no idea that we had parrots, thick billed parrots, and that's well, hmm. well, we're, we need to protect them, right? So they're endangered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a, a little bit unusual one because thick billed parrots used to incur, occur in Arizona in the like in the Chiricahua mountains in the mountains in the they have now retreated completely into Mexico so they and where they're also endangered um they they occur in uh, Sonora um in the mountains of Sonora I believe and really very few other places in Mexico they're quite restricted they they live in uh, in basically virgin pine forests at high elevations um, and there was an attempt to establish re-establish them in in the Chiricahua mountains um, but it failed um, just uh, there, there may in the future be another program to try that but but currently there are no uh, indigenous native parrots in North America that said there are quite a few escaped cage bird parrots that have are doing quite well in places mm -hmm. like Arizona, Tucson. I think you have a, a bird called rosy faced love bird. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. ever seen it. Um, I see that, on a Facebook group in, or uh, a, a Southwest Facebook group that I belong to. I see people. Yeah. Like, okay. They'll see me yeah. near and in Southern, well, Southern California. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In Southern California, there are there are quite a number of species of of parrots that are breeding and doing. And, and, and same is true in South Texas and um, and Florida as well. So we do have some parrots, but not any ones that are native. Of course, there used to be a a bird called the parrot, Carolina parakeet um, that lived. Uh, people, a lot of people don't know about this. It lived in the along the East Coast, um, and it was um, pretty much hunted to extinction uh, by uh, uh, I don't know. I think oh. the early 1800s, middle 1800s, yeah. maybe. You know, yeah. I just thought about that. The use of feathers. You know how people also use them for like fashion mm -hmm. and decor, and even now some of the dancers, right. like Aztec dancers, they they're, they're fake feathers sometimes because you can't just go and get them from a cause anymore and, and things like that. It's it's yeah. changed up. You know, you always think about that. I just wanted to touch on the parrot. Nancy and I met um, a gentleman. He was in a documentary and, and his name escapes me right now. But he was hung out with all the Conyers up in San Francisco. And at the time he was homeless, but he would go and feed them every oh, day. Oh, right. You, you know, right. Talking, yeah. Yeah, they, it, I don't. Yeah. You know, I wish I, I, I know that they, there's a film about him. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. I have not, which I have not seen. <laughs> I, I, oh, you, I've you always watch been it. meaning it's to. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, cause he yeah I'm sure it time, is. And then he's actually married to the filmmaker now, and we met them both in, up in the Quake huh. Tower area of San Francisco, and they were nursing really? all these baby conures that had been injured or, you know, fallen out of nests and things like that. And yeah. it, was huh. just, it was amazing. It was just, a, it's an amazing story. It, and just, it's different yeah. because, you know, you think about native animals and plants and things, you know, especially when you think of, you know, creating gardens and, 
you know, for birds, it's, it's mm-hmm. good to have native you know, sure. plants in your garden and things Absolutely. like that and not use pesticides, yeah. et cetera. But he had a take on like, hey, these birds are here. We should protect them hmm. even if they're not native. We need right. to take care of them because they've, you know, adapted here. So it's an interesting. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. I, I basically agree with that. The only place I, I, I maybe part ways is that some species, some invasive species, um, take push out native species right. uh, or destroy habitat. I know in the east, where I live in the east, I live in Maine, but I used to live outside of Washington, D.C. And the Chesapeake Bay, for instance, these very beautiful um, mute swans, a large, beautiful swan, mm-hmm. is native to Europe. But it's really destroying a lot of fragile habitat in Chesapeake Bay. It's tearing up Hmm. acres and acres of eel grass that many other species, not only birds, but things like blue crabs uh, require as kind of nursery areas. So, you know, it's, that's a hard call. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm reverential of all life, but I'm more reverential of, of native bird life than I am invasive bird life. So it's a, it's it's a beautiful species, but either or thing when you look at it, you know what I mean? You can't just go, okay, this or that, depending on each area is different. Every, yeah, yeah, each area is different. Yeah. And habitat going away. You know, Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing too. What I love about this being a book for kids that, you know, they they're going to keep going through it's such a, it's a thick book i mean there's there's they're going to learn a yeah. lot and parents you know can sit down with them and and work with this together and go and explore and and document you know i think we could get a bunch of little citizen scientists out there with this <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know? and i think that's yeah. what you think well, I, but go ahead no i, w- I was just going to say there are some there's a there's a section there of things you can do to help birds also and um i think that's a um, that that would actually be things that yeah. kids could think about, not not just you know political things, but actual involvement at a at a one on one level. And mm-hmm. and one of them is citizen, be, you know, become a citizen scientist and scientist in your own home. And there are projects like uh, the Audubon uh, Society runs something called Project Feeder Watch. Cornell University has eBird which is an amazing uh, tracking program that that really now at, at this point hundreds of thousands of people uh, contribute to it so it's it's a it's a huge citizen based database and kids can contribute to it as well um, so that's something that uh, I think is important you know if you want to if you're if you want to get your kids involved in a in the, a meaningful conservation sort of Thinking about conservation, and there's the other the other uh, items that are on that spread. Are um, I'm a big advocate of keeping cats indoors. Um, mm-hmm. It's a bit controversial with some people, but um, cats in just in North America kill hundreds of millions of birds, not just millions, but hundreds of millions of birds every year. And it's it's a simple thing. And cats are safer if they're indoors too, and they're yeah, just natural like, predators. Out and <laughs> out here, yeah, say goodbye. It's like the hello coyotes. Yeah, like coyotes cats. and bobcats yeah. can take your cat. You know, not oh, mine. Yeah. Not so cool. maybe in in your in your in Tucson, uh, most cats do stay indoors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. Well, they do. And they don't want to go out in the heat either. Now we've seen some people yeah, actually well, put sad. their cat out in the front yard on a on a oh, leash, and yes. it's ridiculous. And then the next day we saw the cat and the leash and the bobcat running. Yeah, yeah, you know. So Is that right? Oh, jeez. Yeah, the yeah. cat had no chance so, of getting away because it was. Yeah. No, you know, no. And so if you want to protect your cat and your local birds, keep your cat indoors, I guess. Is I'm with best. you. I'm with you. I'm exactly. with you on that. Mm-hmm. I want to ask before you go, did you, were you yeah. a, a child birder? Did you grow up, uh, you know, watching birds and listing them? Yeah, not listing them so much, but I did grow up, my parents had bird books um, and they were kind of interested. I was a little more interested than they were after after I started painting birds, which I didn't do until I was about 30, um, and now it's sort of 
my main focus is is illustrating bird books. Uh, I also do writing, but but I'm very interested in in painting birds. But it's funny when my mother um, when I started painting birds, she said, "You know, up in the attic, I have some stuff that I saved when you were like eight or nine, and they were all drawings." And and she said, "You know, they're almost all birds." <laughs> and I said, "Really? I can't believe that." <laughs> yeah, you were really interested in birds when you were young, and then and then when I was a teenager, I kind of, you know, moved away into other things and and didn't really get back involved until I was in my mid twenties. So, mm-hmm. come it came and it started young, but then it petered out, and then it's then I, and, and ever since I've been in my early to mid twenties, it was like taking over my life. So. Oh wow. That's, it's cool. I think um, it's, it's exciting. You know, yeah. The teenage years get you get that little change um, that happens to everybody um, because <laughs> right. the whole world opens up. But I think there is something <clears throat> about getting out as as you know as youth. And I know the Audubon Society they also have youth programs. And um, right. you know, actually, I, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor today is um, Coronado Motor Hotel, it's a historic hotel in Yuma, Arizona, the Yuma Crossing National Heritage Area, and it's right, I mean, it's two blocks from the lower Colorado River where they've restored this area, and I mean, you can go kayaking and canoeing and see all this water bird life, and then you've got flycatchers and hummingbird gardens, it's awesome, so Yuma is amazing, over 400 species of birds yeah. uh, live or migrate there, and mm-hmm. um, they are going to have their very first Yuma Bird Nature and History Festival coming up the first weekend of 2019. Uh, so there's field trips, activities. Um, there's there's also wildlife. They're going to be going on and doing, you can go out to watch uh, desert bighorn sheep. There's a history that they're going to be showcasing, the area's military history, stargazing. There's a canoeing day trip uh, going to the Salton Sea for bird and nature observation. So oh. a lot is happening. So everyone, January 4th through 6th, if you go to CoronadoMotorHotel.com, it's up on their events page, and uh, they're adding new presentations every day, including one by Martin Kenefick, uh, who wrote Birds of Trinidad and Tobago. He's going to be doing a, a special mm. speaking thing Fantastic. there. So cool. I know. You should come out. Yeah. Jonathan, come <laughs> south. Come hang out with us in Arizona. You've, you've, you've convinced me. <laughs> <laughs> you get a cheap airfare, and I'll, I'll be right there. <laughs> hey, they have an international airport. That sounds great. That's one thing. They have, they have, uh, what is it? It's really the world of wings in Yuma, Arizona. It's where mm-hmm. the first airplane landed. It's right outside that hotel, actually, in Arizona. <laughs> but they have all this air history. And it's to me, it's about birds and airplanes. That's, that's what's going on over there. Uh, but wow. everyone, again, go get Jonathan's book here. It is awesome. Uh, again, it's Jonathan Aldifer. And you can go to his website as well, jonathanaldifer.com. But it's National Geographic Kids Bird Guide of North America. Amazon has it. Barnes & Noble has it. National Geographic has it. Uh, you'll find it online and in your bookstores. And really highly recommend this for kids and for families to get together, especially this summer and upcoming fall season to get out there and do some birding. And uh, we're going to close off with some Hollywood history of cartoon birds with Steve Schneicker. <laughs> and we're going to play Uncle Remus's <laughs> Tales by the Tall Men Group. And uh, so you can go to tallmengroup.weebly.com for that. It's off of their album, Too Tall. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, listeners. Big Blend Radio airs Monday through Thursday, Fridays and Sundays. You can go to bigblendradio.com for the schedule. Thanks so much for joining us. Jonathan. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Nancy. Take care. Happy birding. Okay. Okay, You too. Bye. Here it is, everyone. Some Hollywood history. Overture. Turn the lights. This is it. We'll hit the heights. And oh, what heights we'll hit. On with the show, this is it. As television became a phenomenon and began to draw audiences away from movie theaters, many children's TV shows included airings of theatrical cartoons in their schedule. This introduced a new generation of children to the cartoons of the 1920s and 1930s. Welcome to Hollywood History's Genre of Bird Characters in Classic Animation. Good old wackety Woody Woodpecker was created in 1940 by legendary animator Walter Lance. As he plays his tricks, you will get your kicks.
Woody is one amazing woodpecker. From Paramount Studios in 1939, directed by Dave Fleischer, Popeye (laughs) tries to convince a green parrot on its perch. After Popeye frees all of the other animals in Olive Oil's pet shop, he is free. The parrot tells Popeye, Why should I go out and take my chances against the world when I know I am safe here? No, siree. Leave well enough alone, honk, honk. Leave well enough alone. I know myself, and I'll tell you, just leave well enough alone. From Warner Brothers, we have Daffy Duck, that's despicable. Henry Hawk, I'm a chicken hawk, see? And I want me a chicken. The Road Runner, Mimi, Mimi, Tweety Bird. I thought I saw a pooty cat. I did, I did. I did saw a pooty cat. Foghorn Leghorn, Miss Prissy Hen, oh, yayo, and her son Egghead Jr. Two favorites of mine are Beaky Buzzard. I'm bringing home a baby, Bumblebee. Oh, won't my mother be so proud of me? <laughs> and Al Jolson. I love to sing about the moon and the juna and the spring. I love to sing about a sky of blue or a T for two. Anything with a swing of two. And I love you. Oh, I love it too. I love it to sing. When you wish upon a star, makes no difference who you are. When you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. Walt Disney Studios brought us Daisy Duck and the stork who delivers Mrs. Dumbo's baby, Dumbo, Zazu, the hornbill from The Lion King, 1939's Oscar winner, The Ugly Duckling, Diablo, Maleficent's red-eyed raven from the beautifully animated Sleeping Beauty, and last but not least, from 1964's Oscar winner, Mary Poppins, A robin's heathering his nest has very little time to rest while gathering his bits of twine and twig. <laughs> and not to forget, Sesame Street's Big Bird, Snoopy's friend Woodstock, Fruit Loops, Toucan Sam, and the Tootsie Roll Pop Owl. Mr. Owl, how many licks does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of the Tootsie Pop? Hmm. Let's find out. One, two, three. Crunch. Three. On that crunch, all I have to say is, Bum pa 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 He come home from work, I was already in bed Mama fix him a plate, I'd stay awake Cause I knew once he was fed He'd climb them stairs, open the door to my room With a pat on the head, he'd sit on the edge Read me a story or two About Brother Bear And Mr. Cricket Oh, Brer Rabbit loved jumping in the thicket And Brave King Lion Saving Sister Cow They lived together in them would somehow And every time Without fail Oh 
off into dreamland I'd sail With daddy reading them Uncle Remus tales Now that old storyteller He lived in a cabin in the south With a corncob pipe Bouncing just right Stories flowed with the smoke from his mouth And Daddy would read them Just the way they was read Damn creatures came alive At my bedside Sometimes scared me a bit Like when Sister Fox Met Swamp Gator That gives it eater Nearly ate her Don't be frightened now Brother Frog You'll be safe in that old holly log Every time Without fail Off into dreamland I'd sail With daddy reading Them Uncle Remus tales Now I come home from work My boy's never asleep I fix me a plate Climb them stairs Into his room I will peek Him and his friends Are playing them video games I shake my head Shut the door Think to myself What a shame For poor brother bear And Mr. Cricket Nobody cares, brave rabbit in the thicket, or brave king lion, saving sister cow. Wish my daddy would read me one now. Like when sister fox met swamp gator, man that gives it eater, nearly ate it. And every time, without fear, off into dreamland I'd sail. My daddy read them Uncle Remus tales. Some nights we'd both fall asleep to them Uncle Remus tales.